ก็คุณเนรุทเอกนี่ก็จะสังเกตได้ว่าคนหน้าจอเขาก็จะมีตัวโมเดลซึ่งเขามอบให้เราเป็นของขวัญก็เสียงขอเสียงตบนี้เขานิดนึงซึ่งตอนนี้เนี่ยเทคนิคที่เขาจะมาสอนนี่ก็จะค่อนข้างพิเศษนิดนึงซึ่งบางทีคือคนที่เคยเรียนโปรแกรมซีบัตมาอาจจะไม่ได้ใช้เทคนิคนี้แต่เราจะรู้ว่าเฮ้ยโปรเฟชชั่นอลเองเขาก็ใช้เทคนิคบางอย่างซึ่งเขาเรียกว่าเป็นฮิตเทนฟีเจอร์เป็นจิวจิวโมอย่างหนึ่งซึ่งน้อยครั้งที่จะมีคนมาแชร์ความรู้แบบนี้ซึ่งตอนช่วงเช้าถ้าเราได้นั่งเราจะรู้ว่าเขาเป็นคนที่ค่อนข้างเขาเรียกว่าแชร์นอร์เลชเพราะเขาเชื่อในในความคิดที่ว่าการแชร์เนี่ยเป็นการที่ตัวเขาเองก็ได้สามารถพัฒนาตัวเขาเองได้ด้วยเดี๋ยวผมส่งต่อไปให้เขานิดนึงเผื่อเขาอยากจะคุยก่อนเริ่มตัวเวิร์กช็อปตรงนี้ so maybe you would like to talk briefly about what kind of seminar this would be mm-hmm. and okay. uh, what they will earn from this well hello very nice to meet you all um, we have approximately two hours and 30, and 30 minutes to do um, this demonstration and obviously I could spend an entire semester with you teaching. So in two hours and 30 minutes, we're going to try and do a, a lot. I'm open to you asking questions during it okay. that are specific to maybe something I'm doing that I'm not explaining very well, or if there's something you would like to see and I have time to show it to you, just raise your hand. And Gomesh or Pan will ask the question. Okay. ก็เดี๋ยววันนี้เนี่ยเรามีเวลากันประมาณ2ชั่วโมงครึ่งงานจะเสร็จประมาณ4โมง45แล้วมี Q&A session หลังจากนั้นประมาณ15นาทีแต่ถ้าเกิดเรามีคำถามระหว่างที่มี workshop เกิดขึ้นอย่างเช่นบางอย่างเขาเขาบอกว่าเขาอาจจะไม่ได้อธิบายโดยละเอียดแล้วเราไม่เข้าใจให้ยกมือขึ้นเดี๋ยวผมกับอาจารย์คนสวยคนนี้จะไปจัดการให้นะครับผม So I'm going to focus on doing a bust, and the design that we're going to do kind of together. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know what I'm going to do, but that's the point: is to kind of go in and explore and find a design. I do know that what I want to achieve is some kind of a random alien design. I'm not doing an orc. I'm not doing a vampire. It's going to be more freeform, and. All of you should have a file called Pygmalion. Okay, let me explain. ก็เดี๋ยววันนี้เขาจะมาสอนเทคนิคการขึ้นบัสบัสก็คือตั้งแต่ช่วงหน้าอกขึ้นไปหัวถามว่าแต่ตอนนี้เขาไม่รู้ว่าจะออกมาเป็นลักษณะยังไงแต่ก็คือรู้ว่าไม่ใช่ตัวออฟไม่ใช่ตัวสัตว์ประหลาดที่เราเคยรู้จักกันมาก็จะเป็นการ explore for เหล่านั้นแล้วก็ตัวไฟล์ของเราที่จะมีอยู่บนหน้าจอก็จะมีเจ้าตัวนี้อยู่ So everyone has this. Okay, ทุกคนมีนะครับ Okay, is there an opportunity to open that up on your desktop or? เราเปิดขึ้นมาเลยครับถ้าคนไหนเปิดหรือว่าใช้งานโปรแกรมไม่ได้เนี่ยยกมือขึ้นเผื่อเพื่อนๆที่ค่อนข้างซาเพราะจริงๆเราสอบที่จะสำหรับซีรัสบิกิเนอร์ถึงอินเตอร์มีเดียนะครับ Okay, so What I'm going to do, just so you understand what that model is, and a little bit about how the layers are, uh, all of you know ZBrush, you know the interface. Uh, most of them are either beginners or intermediate. Okay, excellent. So let me sit down and walk you through just a couple things about this model so that you understand how to use it. Okay. Okay, so everyone can hear me okay? Okay, So in in this file, in this file, what we have is the high res version, which means you can see the layers, and the layers on this are not very many, which is intentional. ก็ตัวไฟล์ตัวนี้มันมีอยู่5สับดิวิชันเลยแล้วนะคนที่เรียนโปรแกรมซีบัตก็จะรู้ว่าเราสามารถที่จะปรับในสับดิวิชันเลยว่าที่สูงสุดเนี่ยมีเลเยอร์ได้ซึ่งตอนนี้เขาก็มีอยู่ประมาณ5เลเยอร์5หรือ6หนะ
ะซึ่งเหตุผลปกติบางทีจะมีเยอะกว่านี้แต่ในเคสที่เราทำเดโมตรงนี้เพื่อไม่ให้สับสนโคมไลก็จะมีแค่ประมาณ5 l a y e So in this, what I want you to see, because we're going to basically repeat this whole process, but with a new design. Okay. Oh, good. So on this model, you can see that the uh, topology is pretty smooth, and that's because we're using Dynamesh and then fixing the Dynamesh with. Using under the geometry, you can see there's a variety of things to choose from. That's our Dynamesh, which I'll show you in detail. But z r e m e s h e r this one here, is what gives us good topology. Okay, And as you look at these layers, there's one up here which I, I should have named. Uh, if I turn that off, it reveals some old paintwork. Not important. So this gives you a clean image to look at. But there's no detail. This is just the basic form. And if we go to the next level here, there's more details that you can see that are hand sculpted. And then the next one, just labeled alphas, is where I drag on some simple textures to make it feel more organic. So if I render this really quickly. You can get a sense of those textures being showcased, and then pose is just to give it a little bit of a sense of character and attitude. And the last layer is color, which I do my coloring usually. Without any posing, it just allows me to paint symmetrically and be able to see it. But I have this pose layer to always be able to see what the end result will be. In addition, when I am doing color, I don't use this material. I prefer to use a skin shader, which is down here. So now I can see a little bit better what those textures are going to look like. And something else I just want to point out: see how black the shadow is. That can be fixed by going to your material and changing your environment shadow to a little bit less. So now it's a bit more realistic, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time in ZBrush talking about rendering. It's mostly going to be about design. So now it's a bit more realistic, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time in ZBrush talking about rendering. It's mostly going to be about design. So now it's a bit more realistic, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time in ZBrush talking about rendering. It's mostly going to be about design. And I prefer to use just basic gray material. However, I've made a variety of materials that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Because if, if you look at my gray material here, there's no definition 
on the underside, which makes it difficult in terms of reading subtle forms. So this material that I made allows me to read my forms better. However, you don't have this material. So what I'm going to show you later on is how to make this material. But for now, we're all going to work on the exact same available standard gray material. Is it not good? Okay. Now you know how to do it. <laughs> Sure. How to, but not strong enough. <laughs> okay, this is much better, but flaccid. Do you have a coin? A coin? Because it's warm. Smart. Yes, it's a good job there's a woman here. Thank you, Pan. Okay, so let's begin. Just a few housekeeping rules in how I like to work. Some of you create your, your own user interface. Because I do a lot of education on ZBrush, I use the basic ZBrush out of the box interface. Now, some of the menus are placed in different areas probably than what you're seeing and that's just because of the relationship of my computer to the projectors but everything else is all standard I'm not doing anything special <clears throat> for those of you who are beginning uh, hopefully you've gone through this process where you start to sculpt and this happens nothing or worse, when I first bought ZBrush, <laughs> that's all that happened. Um, and then I didn't know how to clean the screen, which one is... One year later. Yeah, one and a half years one later. Half year. So, obviously, we are now ready to sculpt because we hit it in the edit mode. But when we go to sculpt, nothing happens, and that is because we need to turn it into a polymesh 3D. I'm going to do my best to not complain about ZBrush. Okay. <laughs> but there are things that are very strange that we all just have to accept. So if you are frustrated with ZBrush and the interface, you're not the only one, and just accept it. <clears throat> it some of the things I'm going to show you are not because it's the right way to do it, it's just my preference. So for example, when I hold the space bar, it opens up this window, which I think you all are familiar with. Dynamic. I prefer to turn that off. So when it's not highlight like this it is off. Additionally, I prefer to work in symmetry mode. So you can see now I have two dots. So I'm toggling X on and off. And that's about all that I need to do to start working. I change my brush size and occasionally my focal shift. For the most part, though, I'm not going to use anything special. The main brushes that I use are clay. Inflate. Move. Uh, standard. And as you know, smooth comes with all of those. So now that we have our clay brush, the temptation is to start to sculpt two eyes, a nose, a chin. 
ส่วนใหญ่เวลาขึ้นมาเราต้องพยายามอยากลองตั้งนะใช้ตัวของแฟนตัวนี้ And actually I'm done so any questions thank you ข้อสอนจบแล้วกลับบ้านได้ They'll fix it in post Um, you can sculpt this way. You can build up enough material to get something to be um, big, but the problem is, it's not how you would sculpt as a sculptor. Really, you want to put big amounts of clay and move very quickly. So what I'm going to do is just set up a couple things here that will be the the standard way of working. I go to geometry. Let's remove ZBrush remesher and go to DynaMesh. This is going to be an important thing for me to start adding a lot of clay, basically. And the resolution is too high. I would prefer to work somewhere around 16. Okay, great. <laughs> so now that I have things the way I'm comfortable with, now I can move. Excuse me. I can use my move tool. And I, I can move large amounts of material very, very easily. And as you probably already know, I'll get to a point where this starts to happen. And it, I've just used up all of my polygons. If I want to make this become shoulders, I'm going to stretch it out to the side, and now it's just a mess. So by holding the control key and dragging outside, what? Excuse me. I have to turn DynaMesh on. So by moving this around and then dragging off to the side, <coughs> so now we have the process that we need to use to start sculpting very, very quickly and looking for the design. Because that's how we're going to approach this. We're going to allow ourselves to discover the design and have the sculpture inform us as to what to do with it. And all I'm doing here is just adding a little bit more clay. <coughs> I'm going to move things around, and I'm just trying to get a few features in place so that I feel like I have enough to work with. Turning off perspective for the moment. That could be a neck. How many of you were in this session this morning? Okay. 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 That's helpful to know because what I'm doing here is working with proportion. I'm trying to find the feel of this character in a very coarse way first. Now it's obvious at this point that I have a head of something and shoulders. So what I like to do as a designer is I want to make sure that these shapes feel the most balanced first and if they feel balanced at this point the rest of it's going to be easy to pull off. So 
So what kind of alien is this going to be? Well, I'm not sure yet, but that's kind of the fun of... That's the fun of working this way. Let me ask you this. Does this feel generally correct? Versus that. I mean, that, that's an extreme example, but all I did was move two things and already something is wrong. This doesn't feel like a good start. And that's kind of my point about earlier when I was talking about the balance of proportion. And what you have to do is get it into a place where you feel like you've got the big shapes first. And if you've got the big shapes, the rest of it is detailing and it's very important. But the temptation is within ZBrush, you can so easily detail and people tend to prematurely start to do what is the fun part of it. It's like a trap, right? Oh yeah, very much. So what I'm doing now is just looking at various shapes within this head shape to start giving it a start of a design, of a theme. Because it isn't quite there yet. It's a little, what I don't want to do is have a design that looks like an, a human being can wear a rubber mask. It needs to feel much more special. And right now it feels like a human being could wear this. So we'll stretch the neck. And maybe make the neck in front view a little bit narrower up at the top. And all of this is being done with the move tool. Even in, in front view, I can move clay in and out. And the way you do that, if you don't already know, is you click on the surface, you hold the Alt button, and when you move to the right or the left, it pushes in or out. So let's give this guy a little bit of a hunch. And maybe drop that down a bit. In addition to your side view, you also want to make sure that you get something compelling in front view. And currently my front view is really very, very uninteresting. So I'm going to take the chance at this point to maybe prematurely start to sculpt specific things. And this is where I find the magic start to happen very quickly. I'm not worried about the details. I'm only worried about the big forms and proportion. That's all that matters. And each time you'll see, I'll use the Dynamesh feature by drawing off to the right a mask, and that gives me more clay, more resolution. Another thing that I like to do on occasion is it might seem premature to start to add details such as, I have a question for you before I complete that thought. In Thai, mm -hmm. do you use Latin anatomical terms, like when you're teaching anatomy? I do teach in Latin, like clavicle. Clavicle, yeah, yes. tricep, yes. sternocleidomastoid. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Uh, I teach in 
I asked that question because I'm going to use the Latin terms. Um, and what I was getting at is, I like to put the landmarks of certain features in place so that I can start to see how choices are going to affect other decisions. So just by blocking that in very quickly, I have some highlights, some darks and lights, and it lets me see what I'm doing with the design. I'm not sold yet on this creature. It's humanoid. We know that, or I know that that's something I want to achieve with this, but it doesn't feel quite right yet. And why is that? Partially, it's because my sensibility wants to generate certain forms, but also I think the proportions are just not in the correct place. So I'm going to first make sure that I get it correct. And again, don't forget that at any time, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and um, we will answer it for you. So no questions. We're good so far. Okay. <clears throat> okay. My resolution of 16, I think, is maybe too low now. So I'm going to... Going a little bit higher, softening it. If you've ever sculpted traditionally, um, I find that using a torch, an actual flame on my clay, or a hot hair dryer, allows me to melt the clay together to kind of still have it be the general same shape, but it cleans up the surface so I can start seeing it more cleanly. And here is where I start to do something that I find very useful, and that is I let, I put some clay down, and as I put the clay down, I loosely sprinkle on some form, and I step away from it to see if something is happening that's interesting to me visually. I'm using traditional human landmarks, temporalis, an indication of an ear, occipital lobe. <laughs> and every now and then I zoom out far away to see if these forms are starting to feel compelling. And I, there's something happening to the design that interests me with his cheekbones. See how they're coming forward? That, that can be an interesting feature to play with. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the, it's the zygomatic bone at the front. And because that's happening there, Maybe there's a form that I can use back here to replicate similar form language. I So something's happening there. I don't know if it's right yet. And you can see that what I do a lot is move back and forth from the move tool 
and the clay tool because I'm, I'm just trying to sort out what my design is. And Additionally, as I evaluate whether this design is working or not, you'll see that I look at it not in perspective yet. And it, but I'm looking along this edge to see that the design feels good. And I'm looking along this edge in three-quarter view. Mostly, I'm thinking of the skull shape. And believe it or not, I feel, I feel like I'm getting close to having found a possible direction visually. I'm going to turn it down a little bit to slow it down on me. I'm also going to get one other tool that I like to use, which is my trim dynamic. And, and one last one, which is a pinch tool. And that completes my palette for developing the shape of this character. So the next most important thing to do because it will inevitably happen, is let's save this in my proper file. OK. If you've ever sculpted traditionally, one thing that has never, ever happened to me holding a clay model in front of me is have it disappear in my hands. <laughs> and I've had it happen here many times. OK, so from this point forward, I'm going to start to use my trim dynamic brush because I feel like there's, if I can get it, I feel like there's uh, some forms that want to have more of a planar look to it. Another thing about the planar tool that it does for me is it forces shapes to happen that I didn't intend on. And I will be as sloppy as I am right now, sketching on the surface and just seeing what happens with the geometry by randomly skipping across the surface. Okay, pay attention to what I'm doing here. I'm letting my sculpting tool dance across the surface. And I'm going to shift from that back to the clay tool. And, and what I'm looking to have happen are visual happy accidents.
I'm going to give myself more of a rib cage here. I'm sticking out his sternum. And much like the avatar banshee profile that I was talking about, I'm thinking in terms of what would be an interesting side view silhouette. I'm taking his vertebrae at the back, his cervical vertebrae, and I'm increasing the size of that just to see the flow of the lines with everything that's happening. I add a little bump to the beginning of the clavicle at the manubrium. Increase the jugular notch. And just by adding these simple features, it gives me a better sense of how to judge the overall form language here. I might just use the pinch tool for the fun of it at the front. Just I also use the pinch tool in the negative to sharpen areas. And once again, I'm going to use the move tool to give a very specific shape to this sternal protuberance, much like the breastbone on a chicken. Now, that might seem odd to start designing a character where I haven't resolved anything in his face, yet I'm spending time down here. Sometimes I'll move to a place that's not as important, and I'll play with forms in this area because I'm going to be a little bit less distracted by trying to do a likeness of something. Some of the pectoralis muscle, musculature there. Okay, I'm just going to push that back, give it a nice angle from down here. This is the view I'm focusing on to get this to move backwards. And you can see sometimes I really sculpt from far away because I want to see the bigger picture and how all of these lights and darks are working together. And once again, using the move tool, I'm moving large amounts of geometry to just play with proportion. Long face, obviously we've lost the proportion there. Again, you can, you can pretty safely say that that doesn't feel right. Why is that? Again, because we are pre-wired to know what generally feels right or feels wrong.
It's not exactly what I want, but it, there's something starting to happen back here that I find interesting. That might be too bold. I'm talking about this shape back here. But for now, I'm going to commit to this general idea, and I'm going to start to do some detailing to see whether or not this is going to work. Because we don't have a mouth, we don't have a nose, and the geometry is not very good yet. It's too soon to escape from DynaMesh and go into Z Remesher. I saw something in the mouth here that I thought could be an interesting detail to work with. I have a very strong jawbone and a strong masseter muscle back here. That that will either make the character look like they are strong or old because we're making the cheeks very hollow. And now I'm curious about what kind of nose I'm going to do. It's kind of an automatic default in alien design, and that is you don't have a human nose. Get rid of the nose entirely, and it's already going to feel alien. But where should I place my nostrils? Where should I place my mouth? We can't really tell yet where it is, but we know that if I do the mouth, I'm going to do some drawing on here, that high. That's just horrible. And we're not going to do that. If I give him a nice big old schnoz, it's no longer really that alien. So we don't want that. So by removing his nose, it kind of makes it easy to think of a design that implies it is alien in nature. So for whatever reason, that feels to me a little bit big, but it feels like that that may work. And the reason it feels big is the rest of the proportions here are off. So I'm going to mask that off. And I'm going to change the scale. And change its location. And it already feels better. Saving this one. So we have our basic landmarks here. We got eyes, we got a nose area, the place for a mouth to be. But the one thing I want to be careful of is the eyes are the most important thing. With any, any design you do, you got to make sure that your eyes feel right. So before I continue trying to resolve certain things, I'm going to go ahead and start to develop the size and scale of my eyes. Just by blocking it in ever so slightly. So I think that that's going to work. My nose is still too big. That's my problem. And in addition to that, it feels very boring in side view. So I'm going to do something here that may or may not work. I'm pulling out this ridge, this bony central ridge, because that's going to lend, I think, some interesting visual activity. When I'm rotating like this, I'm 
looking at everything that we've been discussing so far, I'm paying attention to the edge, paying attention to this three-quarter view. And there are some new problems. There's new successes, but new problems as well. And the problems are in the mouth. I don't have my mouth yet. So one question I want to ask myself as the designer of this is what kind of animal metaphor are we using for the mouth? Human, primate, which is the same thing. It's, it's a cut through here. Is it going to be something like this? Or is it going to be something very, very alien where maybe what it is, similar to the creature that you have, it's a flap of some sort that obscures the mouth that's underneath. And I hate it. So what I'll often do just what you saw me do is rather than command Z and go back out of it, I will soften over the top. And the reason why is I want to have an opportunity to have shapes be there that I didn't plan on. So these were the shapes that I was seeing. And I'm going to use those for a moment to allow myself to discover a mouth. And right now it looks like he's a baseball player with uh, chewing tobacco. Not the look I want. He should feel, he should feel commanding and powerful and authoritative. So we're getting somewhere now with that goal. I can start to see the beginnings of an interesting mouth forming. Any questions so far? That's a no. Okay. I'm running out of polygons to kind of see anymore, but I'm not going to move forward just yet. So this is a deep moment of concentration for me because I'm at the point where it really matters, these choices that I'm making. That's a little unusual there, so I'm going to beef that up a bit, add a landing point for it. And I'm OK with the rest. I think that what the problem is that the, the neck here is too wide. So let's thin that up a bit. I don't know if you noticed what I just did there. I up my Dynamesh, and I lost a lot of information that I thought was useful. So now I'm at a point where I can go a little bit higher. Yeah, 
Now, I, I'm getting close to the point where I feel like I know what my design is. So what I can start to do is get specific about certain things to help me make final decisions. <clears throat> Let me see if this idea is going to work. So I'm going to try something here. It's a combination of the alien that you have, the Pygmalion, but done hopefully a little bit more elegantly. Okay. This is still a pretty low resolution model, but what's important is, with the exception of down here, I've got everything that I need in terms of general geometry so that I can... So now what I can do is start to really resolve things, but before I go there, this is my process that I find most useful. I'm going to duplicate this model. And what I'm going to use is this top version. And I'm going to use the, I'm going to turn DynaMesh off because I don't need it anymore. But I'm going to use Z Remesher now. So now that I have that, my, the only number you really need to be mindful of for this demonstration is the target polygon count. We're going to use five and see what that yields. This will take just a moment. So for those of you that don't know the power of Z-Remesher, if you've not had ZBrush in the years past, it's really difficult to appreciate how unbelievable it is. It's the most incredible, magical function that's ever existed in computer software. So it has rebuilt and organized all of my topology in such a way that when I continue to sculpt on this, the flow is going to be quite nice. However, I've lost all of my detail, which is why, under the subtool, I saved out the old version. So my old version is underneath. And what I want to do is up-res this version, Command-D, turn on my lower-res version, or the lower version, And what I'm going to do is project all of the surfaces of the brand new retopologized skin. And I'm going to make sure that all of that surface sucks down on top of this by using project, which it just did. And I increase the resolution one more time. You want to slowly build up to this. Otherwise, it just takes unnecessarily long. Up res it one more time. So the divisions are higher and higher. I've projected, and I may just up res one more time. And we project one last time. So even though this may not look like it's a high-res model, it's extremely high, but it has captured 
all of the detail of the low res model below. So let me explain what I mean by that. This is the version that we want. And as I soften the surface a little bit, I start to see a very clean model. It's got all of the geometry that I had before, but I have the capacity now using my subdivision levels to go low and high. And this is now where I can actually add an additional layer because I'm going to start to experiment with my design. And I will call it design one, for example. Save your efforts. And we're good to go. So where I'm going to focus my attention is around the nose and the eyes. I see some really lovely opportunities here for creating musculature that's going to stretch around the eyes. So you can see the definition of the eyes starting to occur. It's at this point that I may want to actually put eyeballs in place, spheres, so that I can start to see how I'm going to sculpt the eyelid detail a little bit more accurately. So I just come down to my subtools, and I'm going to append it by adding a sphere 3D. And that sphere is now in his neck, like a big old goiter. Take that, move it, and scale it. And then we'll place it Put it back in his head. And here's where you want to be very careful to not orient it incorrectly or have it too big, too small. So I'm changing the scale of this a bit, moving it in. And in side view, it feels like it's going to be just fine. So. Now that I have my eye in place, I'm going to create a new one. So I'm using the plugin Subtool Master. And under Subtool Master, what I want to do is mirror this. I'm using all default functions. And it gives me my second eye. So now I have two eyes, and that means as I sculpt my eyelids, I can be much more accurate with what's happening. And I take it there's no questions just yet? Good. I'm either doing something right or very confusing. Good. I'm going to do one small detail here which is important to make an eye feel like it's seated properly. 
I'm going to use the pinch tool in the negative. And that's that's going to help me place that nicely. I'm using the pinch tool in the positive, and it gives me a nice edge for my eyelid. And it's a little bumpy, but it's easier to move that go. And the last thing I like to do is use the inflate tool to get that brow to kind of land on it a little heavier. Okay, let's continue with this. There are some forms that I do not like at all and some that I like a great deal. So I'm going to take advantage of those shapes. And let's work on our nose just a little bit more. Now remember, one of the things that we're trying to do here is a design sketch. This is a concept. This is not a final direction. So we don't want to get too married to getting details to be perfect. And also, if you pay attention to your time, which you always should, the thing that you want to do is remind yourself of how much time is on the clock professionally so that you can make sure that you don't spend too much time on an area that doesn't matter at all. So what that means is, as I develop this character, I'm thinking of the most important way that this character is going to feel realistic and viable, etc. And there's a lot that I can do with my alphas when I start throwing texture on this. So don't labor the back of the head if we're never going to see this. What I do want to labor is the nose, the eyelids, and this arbitrary mouth detail, which I've still yet to figure out, actually. Sometimes it's okay to do things where you actually don't even know what it is exactly that you're doing, which is currently what I'm doing with the mouth. I don't really know what I want there yet, but there isn't the time to go in and resolve it. The whole point of this exercise is to make sure that you show something to the client that's a start. So remember what I said earlier today about a bad decision is better than no decision? I, mean, I hope that what I'm doing is not a bad decision. There will be elements of this where there are certainly bad decisions, but for the most part, what I'm doing is informing a variety of things that work and some things that may not work. Here's a moment where I think for some arbitrary reason that's too flat. I like a lot of activity in my form language. So having that bulge out just a little bit and maybe having our nose feel slightly more snappy where there's a bit of a peak here, that's going to feel more interesting to me than what I had just a moment ago.
Okay, we're getting close to doing some of the fun, juicy stuff that makes doing creature design a thrill. So no questions? You guys are very quiet bunch. I think this part right here I'm going to change my masking function to the pen, and I'm going to draw on here an area that I'm going to push into the face. I'm creating some kind of a scoop. Why? Because it just seemed like the right thing to do. I'll never be viewing this character from underneath. Another thing I like to do, which is an important moment here that I'm just starting to witness in my own design, is I'm going to create another layer here because I want to show you something real quick, which is, we'll call it design two. And I'm seeing flow happening. I'm seeing a line that's flowing like so. I'm seeing lines that flow up this way. And I want to embrace that so that the whole form language of this character is consistent. My eyes. My eyes feel a little too pedestrian, and by pedestrian I mean too human. So maybe I want to do a nice long tear duct, and maybe, I don't know if this is going to work at all, but like a stingray fish, maybe there's an opportunity to create a sensory pit that is pushed back into the head. So let's try that. And really the reason for that was simply because what I want to do is create a form here that makes the eye just feel a little bit more alien, quite frankly. And to me, that was very interesting. Did you see what just happened there?
Did anybody see what happened there? I just want to point something out, which is one of my favorite things that if you're not familiar with ZBrush, the first time I did this, I was so sad. All the detail, I just lost it. It's all gone. I, I, hit, I hit this wrong. I didn't see myself dragging outside of here. It's a horrible experience. It doesn't help, too, that this is a very small area that I'm working on, but I won't cry. And whenever that happens, it really should just be a reminder that you save. So the, the message I'm trying to convey here to all of you about this is it's discovery. It's stopping, looking, and saying, what am I seeing now that I, am, I didn't really plan on doing? And letting that inform you. So see, for example, with our nose, this linear quality doesn't quite feel right. So I'm going to make an adjustment to give it a bit more activity. I'm going to pull this in. I'm going to widen this up top. By having done that, that just gave it automatically a greater sense of realistic, organic feature. In addition, I feel that the overall shape is too constant. So I'm going to pull out a bulge there. And that also gives it a sense of complexity. Those complexities, if you know what they actually do physiologically, it's helpful. But if you don't, again, this is a sketch. So what you're trying to do is convey an idea that feels interesting and compelling. And you can figure it out later if the client accepts this direction. So I don't know about you, but I happen to like very much this pit. Any ideas of what that is? And that's a legitimate question. Anyone have any ideas of what that would be? Sure. Right here. Get rid of what? OK. Sure. That's a, that's a typical area for a lacrimal region. Any other ideas? Do you know how a kangaroo stays cool? Anyone? Any kangaroo, how it stays cool. How it stays, you mean not too hot? Not too hot, yes. We don't have kangaroo in the How about a zebra? <laughs> No, it's OK. Uh, a kangaroo has a special <coughs> gland. And what they will do is they will lick themselves and wipe this gland onto their body. And that causes the skin to be wet with this special mucus. And that allows them, because they don't sweat, it allows them to evaporate and stay cool. So this particular area could be, because your, your boss might just say to you, uh, cool design, but what is this? What is that supposed to be? And if you say, I really don't know, but I just did it, that, that could work against you. So having a general idea of what it is you're trying to do, even if it's a lie, 
is sometimes okay. Okay, so in the spirit of pretending that we are actually doing a real job that's due soon, I have to stop playing. I have to call this done because we're running out of time. In reality, within this classroom, right. um, but we, we're going to take advantage of that and pretend that we need to really finish this as a concept design. So I'm just now realizing that I'd like my eye to be more creative, but I don't have the time. That's okay. But let's make sure that we complete the design. Okay, obviously there's a tremendous amount of detail that has not occurred yet in the neck, in the chest, but we have to call this design done in terms of big forms. So let's commit to this by creating a new layer. It's our alphas. So with regards to using alphas, what we want to do is load in a few of the uh, alphas that I currently have. There's one basic brush. I hope I loaded my alphas. I think I did. Um, down here, I've got a variety of brushes. And any of these brushes can be an alpha. Let me grab it again. So on this particular brush, I have a texture that is Rick Baker's texture. And it's a nice neck, stipply type of texture. We can use it in the negative, in the positive. We can put it on very big and then do small versions of it. But I'd like to open a few other alphas and I'm going to go with something I have which is just a name for something here that has a few textures that I like to use all the time. So I'm going to load this one. I'm going to load this one. This is a very good one. Any of these curved alphas are really quite fantastic. Then there's some nice pore textures. And then one here, which is a strange one, which will give us kind of a nice, unique look. So now that these are loaded in, the one I'm going to focus on, or the two that I'm going to focus on, are these curved ones, because they give me the opportunity to really build up some interesting curved surfaces. So I can do positive or negative. And I'm going to stick with the negative. So here's what I'm trying to point out. I have a variety of curved shapes that's curving this way and then curving the opposite. So depending on how I orient myself, I can quickly load in some very, very specific curved textures to get kind of a nice massing of directional folds within the skin. I'm turning my uh, intensity down a bit 
because I'd like there to be just a hint of this particular texture. I don't want it to be too dominant. So you can see there's just a hint of it. Let's shift over to another texture that's round. Make it a little bit stronger. And uh, Gomesh, time-wise, I've got 13 minutes on the clock for the first hour and a half. Yes. So that means we have another hour after this, correct? Yes, but I think there should be more questions. So yeah. uh, perhaps you can uh, continue doing this, but uh, make it not too long. But I think I, I really like it. OK. So but have them interact with more questions? Yes. OK. So then maybe what I'll do is once I get the textures on, mm -hmm. that's kind of when I'll stop. And okay. then I can start doing specific things based on their questions. OK. That'd be OK. Excellent. All right. Okay, so I'm just going to continue with this for a little bit more to get some of the texturing on here. I'm going to go around the eyes and use my rounder texture. It needs to be a little stronger than what I got here. Around 12. So hopefully what you're seeing is using this directional texture, I can get the flow of all of these wrinkles to feel pretty realistic. And I must emphasize that what I'm not trying to do here is a final creature design. What I'm trying to do is a concept. So if the client likes what I'm doing, I can come back in later and do some really beautiful refined texture passes. Especially when I get down to the neck here, I'm just trying to get stuff to feel organic. And I'm going to really start to rush things down here, just so we can move forward so that you guys can start asking me questions and I can start doing things to this. Okay, I'm going to grab a more unique texture, which is this one here. This is good for the neck. It's good for the straight lines out of the lips. As you can see, it looks like an old man lip. And depending on the orientation, you can create wrinkles in a forehead or wrinkles that just go straight back. But what's nice about this particular one is that it is, it's got a series of pores in it. By the way, these textures mostly came from Aaron Sims, which are available online. So I must give Aaron some credit. And like I said, even though these are not the actual texture that I would use on this creature, it gives it just enough of a sense of organic. I'll use something here which is more of a strange pattern. That's not it. That's it. And that one we might want to reserve for a whole different pass of texturing. And we're thinking of using this one where it's the most bony. <laughs> and then the last thing that I like to do, let's give him some pores. 
I can either use this as a way to drag in some deep pores. Or, actually I forgot to grab it, let me do it really quickly because it's so useful. This one here. And that will give me a nice tiny little pore texture. And what I'll do with this quite often is uh, you'll see I'm adding it as a negative, but I'll add also positive every now and then. Next thing to do is some asymmetric bumps and detail. So I save that also as a layer. So asymmetric bumps, I can use specific little details. I'm turning off, obviously, symmetry. And it might just be that he has a pimple or something up here. Aliens are known to have very bad skin. There might also be a scar. So I have a buried in here is a tool that I might not be able to find so easily. Mm -hmm. This will do. It's a simple little scarring brush. Promise me, none of you ever will do the following. You're not allowed to do this, ever. Uh, it's the scar through the eye. No. It's one of those things that people tend to do all the time with character design, is to make the bad guy look bad. One scar through the eye. No offense if you've done that. But having some purposeful little scratches here and there, are very, very helpful. And even using this as a way to add a positive by holding Alt, you can add positive form to it. We're not going to do veins on this guy, but I just wanted to point that out. And then the next thing to do with regards to these textures, I've got my um, alpha drag here. I'm going to do one more pass within this asymmetrical bump thing and just change up the forehead a bit. Because right now it's too symmetrical. I will also use this brush to start to carve in some very asymmetric forms really quickly. And then the last thing that I would do is asymmetry in general. This is an important one as well. And this is all using the move tool because this is when the character starts to feel real. I drop down the resolution. And I'm going to stay away from the eyes in terms of placement of the eyes, but oftentimes moving the eyes a little bit is very helpful. Let's focus just on the big features. So for example, most things are not perfectly symmetrical in general. And by doing this, it really helps with this psychological sense that this thing is actually real and organic. And what I might do is just an eyelid slightly more closed than the other. And that's not screaming asymmetry, but it's enough that will hopefully make the whole thing feel just a little off. 
I'll push one side in, pull that out, change his neck, give him some scoliosis. And then the last detail would, of course, be a quick pose. And posing, I typically do as a low res pass. Now, if I pose the head, that means I have to pose the eyes. And if I pose the eyes, then I have to connect them, and I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to pose the shoulders. So uh, using a mask and softening the neck transition, I can then rotate the neck, just pull it back into a place where it should rotate from. And maybe I just do a simple twist, like so. Maybe something like that. Maybe even tilt it forward. And all that that does is it, it automatically gives the character a sense of tilt. And maybe I even kick the shoulder up a bit, and drop that one further down. Maybe even bring just the shoulder forward a bit. And now we have our character posed. So then the last thing we would do is just to check things is do a quick render of this. It's probably going to be a very dark shadow. So we want to go under material, change our environment. Make sure perspective is on at this point. And also with perspective, uh, one of the few complaints I have about ZBrush is it makes no sense whatsoever in terms of what the camera is, the focal length. So I tend to turn this. If, do you know anything about cameras, guys? A 50 millimeter lens typically represents standard human vision. In the world of ZBrush, it means nothing. These numbers mean nothing. <laughs> so um, a long lens would typically be a higher number, which would make your object look flatter. Not in ZBrush world, oh no. It's the complete opposite. I've asked them a million times to reconsider this. Yeah, please, anything, but it doesn't exist. So at, at the very least, invert this. So 25 means something closer to what it's intended. So anyhow, there we go. That's our whatever this thing is, alien character. Very streamlined. And command R. I would also go in maybe just because under subtools, let's take the eyes and let's make them a nice shiny material, uh, depending on what. So if we go with something like the shiny black for the whole thing, and I'm going to apply the material to this. And we go back to our skin material. So now we have these nice black, shiny eyes that feel alien, clearly. And because we don't really care too much about the chest, let's render this up. And now we have a rapid, completed design within ZBrush. Given more time, we could take this into Modo. But what I want to do is start to field some questions and see if there are specific things that you would like me to do either to this or from scratch. So maybe it's Q&A time.
<clears throat> I'm just messing around with a few things while questions come up. Were, were there any questions, Jim? Uh, I'm asking them to wrap up what they're doing now. Oh, okay. Maybe you can come check what they have done. Yeah. You know, Don't worry. I'm just going to do a quick look. So there's some doing this. Ooh. Oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> That's wrong. That's not like what we're supposed to do. Get them out of here. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. So quite. So there's some quite. Okay. Scoot in real quick. Okay. Exciting. Oh yeah, that's cool. Nice. <laughs> I'll come on that side too. Excellent. Excellent. Good copy. Better. Yeah. Oop, excuse me. All right, you're taking it to the next level. <laughs> Excellent. That's exciting. Let's see what you got. What? That's amazing. It looks photo real. It's photo real. Good work. Good class. So some of them could follow quite well. Oh yeah, it's obvious. I'm gonna squeeze by all of you. <laughs> nice. Three <laughs> breast ladies. Yes, he's got it figured out. Sorry? Awesome. Wow. Nice. If you want to cut something off? Yes, cut something off. For example, he uh, built, the uh, near thing is that he built something, like, for example, a link that he doesn't want and want to cut it off behind you. Hmm. Well, there's a, there's a variety of ways to cut off something. Okay, and you can show us how you cut off his head. Just bit it out the last one. Just the head by itself. Yeah, just like a slice right here. So under tools, you've got slicing. So slice, if, if you forget what the tool is, where it's located, what you can do is remember what you're trying to do functionally, which is slice, which begins with the letter S. So if you hit S, it takes you to all the tools that begin with an S. So slice curve, if we pick that, 
Now we know that it's an active tool. We're going to go, okay, an active brush. So what we're going to do when we slice, is, this is another part, this is why you're asking the question, because it's not obvious in ZBrush how to do this. There's a few things that will not work. I have layers, and I also have um, subdivision levels. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So that is what happens. So first of all, you have to understand how to select it. I went to slice. I found it here. And then regardless of my brush, I'm holding shift control, and it reveals that particular slicing function. But it won't do anything yet because we have layers. So here's the problem. And it's, it's not ZBrush's fault. Actually, ZBrush having this as a function is pretty amazing. But people get upset because you can't do everything in ZBrush. So forgive it and understand that what you have to do is change your model. So what we're going to do is under Subtool, we're going to save a new version of this by duplicating it. I'm going to get rid of the eyes. They don't matter right now. And what we're going to need to do is, under geometry, well, under layers first, I'm going to flatten all of it. So I've just baked everything. And now, under geometry, because it still won't work. I have multiple subdivision levels. so. I have to get rid of those. The problem is if I keep all of this high resolution stuff, the function is going to take quite a while. So rather than do that, I'm going to drop it down just a little bit for the purposes of this demonstration. Delete lower, delete higher. Now slice curve, watch what happens here. Anything happen? So if I now go to move this, for example, or hide it, you can see that I have, let me make double sided on just so you can see this. I have separated the two by virtue of slicing. So I can keep slicing this by using this brush. Trim curve is maybe something else you want to consider. So let's undo what we just did. Now we're back to our original model. So if we go to trim, I have cut off and gotten rid of the head and flattened the whole surface. So if, like you were saying, you want to remove pieces quite quickly. I've just gotten rid of the shoulders and flattened this out really nice. But those parts don't exist anymore. If I want to trim and still reserve the two places, I need to use these curves here. So slice it that way. Now I have pieces. Does that make sense? OK. You're welcome. That's okay. They're focused. They got work to do. What 
if you were to scout something like, for example, a tentacle like, like the trough, you know, what would you create the tentacle? What kind of technique would you be using? Um, there's a few ways to do a tentacle. If I wanted to add a tentacle to this character, again, what you want to do is plan ahead. So we're going to go back to the previous one. So this one has no, it, it doesn't have any subdivision levels, but we're going to need to use our Dynamesh function again. So and then we're going to open up the snake brush, which is here. And I'm going to grab on his chin or his cheekbone asymmetrically. So I now have a tentacle of some sort, but I've run out of resolution. So now I've used Dynamesh to clean that up and give myself a much higher resolution surface. So if I want to start turning that into a tentacle, I can use Inflate, for example, to take the tip of it and give it some kind of like, if you think of a squid, has those tentacles where its primary tip allows you to have some functionality, so it's swollen there. And maybe there's some extra detail. So now we have some kind of like tentacular cheekbone thing. So that's one way to do it. Alternatively, what you could do is append. We have subtools, and we're going to append by adding a cylinder. That cylinder, we're going to select it. Excuse me. We're going to select that cylinder and we're going to change its proportion by scaling, etc. Here we go. I also find that using the initialize function separately is a bit better if you know about that. So I'm just changing the proportion of this in a very coarse way. And then what I can do with this guy, and let's say that's as big as we want to do it, I can take this and start to sculpt it. So let's pretend we're sculpting a tentacle here. So we imagine that it's got a specific detail in terms of its form language. And in addition to that, we're going to add some swelling to the surface, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you have your tentacle designed, then you need to combine the two. And that's as simple as moving it where it needs to be. There's so many ways to do this process. So we're pretending it's added to the cheekbone. Now that we have that, we have to combine these two. So one way to combine the two of these is to go under, whoops, excuse me. <clears throat> oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so now that we have this piece below this piece, we can simply go to merge down. And those two pieces are merged. And I can start to play with those. But I want you to see something here. Even though I sculpt it and it blends, every time I soften, they're not really merged together which means we, got, we need to go back to Dynamesh. We can combine the two of them, which is no problem. It's now merged. 
And now we can blend the two together properly. So that's one, another way. And then alternatively, you can use the insert brushes. And there's a variety of insert brushes that will allow you to insert all sorts of things. Um, so if I had created, pre-created a tentacle, which you can do, I can now insert a specific detail into my model. And what's amazing about this is you can adjust this as if it was a, a snake on the surface. Do it again. So I can locate it exactly where I want on the surface and drag it around. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Any other questions? The, the easiest answer to that question is um, you study anatomy, you have to understand human anatomy very, very well. But if it's more of a sculpting question, there are a number of ways to do it. And let me just see where this is at. Get, let me let this finish. It just needs 25% more just so I can export the model to Moto so you can see something in a moment. And then I'll do a quick, a quick arm as a, an example of muscle definition. Almost done. <coughs> Just saving out one quick decimated version of this. And if you're curious, I saved it as my borders being frozen and my UVs being s selected. And that will help my color, if I was to use it, come through. Well, ZBrush just screwed up, or I did, one of the two. It, um, hmm. it changed its location in space, which happens. So I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm going to show you the arm so you know what I'm talking about. So here's how I would do an arm. Start off with a new model. And make sure you're ready to dynamesh this. And now it's just a matter of playing with the proportion.
So I'm doing some kind of a creature arm. I'm not going to try and do human because you'll know if it's right or wrong. And if you guys didn't hear the question, the question was basically how do I sculpt anatomy and have it feel correct? The most important thing is to understand anatomy so that you can sculpt it correctly. So if this is the side view of a creature arm, I want you to see just one thing functionally that's a problem that will help you um, appreciate this. This particular tool, when I sculpt on this side, see what happens? It's supposed to add clay and it's just crushing the whole model. That's because it's reading through the model. So the way to fix that so it just adds to the surface and you don't have to worry about what happens on the back side. <coughs> go to brush and under, excuse me, go to, oh, they're all disoriented, um, as am I. I apologize, my, my tools are in such a different place that I'm forgetting where it is at. Uh, my brush modifier. Brush, auto masking? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's down. Oh, oh, oh excuse me, okay. Yeah, I'm used to working on a big Cintiq. So brush, thank you, Gomesh, and auto masking and turn on back face mask. And it works so much better. So now that we've done that, let's just get the proportions of this to feel a little better. More of a shoulder girdle here. Pectoralis. Dynamesh. Okay, so back to the question now. I like to use uh, inflate as a means to kind of get the basic shape in there. And then once I have the general massing, that's when I'll concern myself with the detailing. And I use the clay brush. And now it's just a matter of understanding how anatomy works. But I don't, I don't get into, let me change this because I don't like the material look. I don't worry about trying to build separate muscles. All I worry about is the general blocking in. So that's our deltoid. Our pectoral muscle is coming out of there. We've got our bicep coming out of there, then inside. We start to see hints of the tricep. It's extremely important. It's the most important thing. I want to point something out here as well. I'm seeing an opportunity to uh, show you a problem and an opportunity to fix things with ZBrush. See how there's lots of pointy triangles? If I up res, you see those little pimples all over the surface? As I soften, as I soften these, they don't go away. In fact, they, they get worse. There's a, hit, there's a hidden trick. Hold shift, 
Now we can soften, touch the surface, let go of shift, and now start to soften, and they go away. So now, now it's perfect. Hmm? It's a smooth key. Once, once you hit shift, it turns it to smooth. But when you let go of that function, but you're holding down on the model still, it's a different algorithm, and it smooths differently. I know. I, I didn't know it either. Uh, and it's something I discovered using DynaMesh because I didn't like the fact that when I polish, I get little pimples. Um, so back to the question of anatomy, this, this model has terrible topology in terms of the flow. So we want to use Zemu Mesher real quick. It is done and the things are flowing nicely. We up res and then we just spend our time using our knowledge of anatomy to sculpt surfaces and this is how I typically lay muscles on. So your question might be like how do I get that nice and sharp inside there? You can use the pinch tool, which is here, and you can in the negative. That's obviously too strong, but you can in the negative carve it in and help define what's going on there. But here's what I prefer to do. I'm going to use my standard brush. Cut in, cut in. Make sure you get some nice depth in here. This is a great way to do any type of cleavage, uh, whether it's butt cheeks or actual chest. And once you have the basic zone placed in there, then you can use your pinch tool. Because now it has something to pinch too. And then once you pinch it, the, not, the last thing I like to do is use the inflate tool. And, and then you can inflate around the two surfaces and use that same function of hold, shift, soften, and let go. And it gives you a nice tighter definition. And if you want it to be even tighter, obviously come back in. Oops, excuse me. So that's how I deal with those sharp transitions in muscle groups. can plan ahead so that the mouth, for example, on this dinosaur is, is pre-planned. So I turn this down and you can see the way this is built is a traditional Z-sphere model. So if I was to start from scratch and do a whole new design, I can either use these spheres, which takes a little bit of time to kind of show you. In fact, it'll take so much time because I'm not sure what's happening here. There we go. 
So with Z-spheres, I'm going to do a, f a very, very fast and dirty version of this dinosaur. Um, yeah, bear with me here. I've just totally disoriented myself. There we go. Okay, so in front view, I have my shoulders of a T-Rex. So here, what I'm going to do is add the neck, more neck, more neck. We drag this forward, we'll call this the top of the head. You can kind of see where the shoulders would be. And every now and then, I'll hit the letter A, which allows me to see it as a mesh. However, I want to use classic skinning. See how coarse that is? In addition to classic skinning, I want to turn my density down to one. Now it's box modeling. So with this, what I want to do is add underneath another jaw, basically, because all I have is the head. I can move this around either as um, components. So I'll show you what I mean by this. I'm going to save this as a mesh. Pardon me, duplicate this. Move, okay. All right, so now what I can do, gotta use the right tool here, just under select, lasso, I can reveal one of these polygons. And hopefully this will make sense in just a moment. So there's our polygon. One single polygon. Now with this, depending on your interest in poly modeling, you can take this and subdivide it. Or what I prefer is to actually build from scratch very, very accurately because this is too much like box modeling. I prefer to use real Z-sphere modeling Again, this is the important thing here. Make sure that you have it set, always set, to traditional. How many of you have used Z-spheres before? Is that something you teach, Kamish? Okay, so you know, you probably know the pain of Z-spheres. I find them quite difficult. And because of that, the new version of Z-Spheres, I think, is problematic from my perspective. So go to Adaptive Skin, Classic Skinning, turn Density down, and you end up with nice, clean box modeling. What you can do at this point is add Z-Spheres so that you can add a jaw to this. Here we go, getting close. So at this juncture, I now have the basic foundation for the jaw of that T-Rex. The problem is though, that technique of Z-spheres, for me, I, don't, I used to use it exclusively, but with the, the invention of Dynamesh, I don't feel the need to do it anymore. 
So I would start off with, here's the, here's the basic process now that I would use. I've got my ball. We'll pretend we're doing just the head. Symmetrically. Turn it down a bit here. And what I want you to consider is, I'm making a dinosaur from scratch. This is going to be a, it's going to be a beauty. I can feel it already. And you want to sculpt this. You want to understand what it is you're sculpting in terms of form. So I'm not going to sculpt it with its mouth open. I'm going to sculpt it with the mouth closed. So some kind of a socket here for the eyes. Jaw, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Neck muscles, throat. And once you start to get all the basic features in place, the trick now is how do you separate the jaw? So remember what I showed you before? about separating. Unfortunately, that separates the two from one another. So now what I do differently is I will draw the jaw, invert that, rotate it, open it up, dynamesh. I've got more room now. I can take this and I can push it in like so. Or I can just use the move tool, which has gone. That's weird. I can take it and just pull it inside of his head, which is really horrible. But how, what I've got now is an opening. So that's a very, very fast way to do it. And quite frankly, I think that's the best way to do it now because it allows you to design the, the shape first. So we could come in here and play with general basic forms. We don't want to get too married to uh, shapes that don't matter. And once I have the basic idea of my creature, then you go through the process of Z remeasure. I turn it down very low, even lower. I might even go down to one. So now you can see how simple that is. Imagine we have the rest of the creature. Then we have to commit to saving a layer. In fact, let me actually just do that properly. We're going to pretend that this is the design. I up res, I'm going to create some layer, and we're going to call that layer close. So we take the jaw, draw what you think anatomically is the entire jaw. Place your pivot where the jaw would actually rotate close the mouth, and we discover that our design doesn't quite work. So what that means is we have a small problem. We're proving here that we can open and shut the mouth, but there's a design flaw. So all that you need to do is understand that and make adjustments at the onset so that your design is actually honest and you can either isolate the jaw again, and you can pull the nose out, for example. And now you have an adjustment where that might be a little bit better. And then you would start to sculpt forms. This is not an easy thing to do. It's a little bit of back and forth, back and forth. It's because it's not rigged. If it's fully sculpted and you break it apart and rig it, that's a whole different thing. 
But that's the fastest way that I like to work now. So when I did the previous dinosaur, it was done, granted, using the traditional Z-sphere method, but I would not do that again anymore because it takes too long. But, and this creature also has a closed and open mouth so that I can work back and forth. I have to turn off the lower jaw and turn off his tongue. And turn on perspective. This is from um, Terra Nova, if you happen to know the TV show. And all of this was about creating the new Steven Spielberg Jurassic Park TV show. Right down to the details of the claws and the feet. This is just a sketch though. This would then go to a proper modeling group and they would do the beauty pass on this. Oh, thank you. It was a fun, fun project. Um, I think we're getting close to time, yes. unless you'd like to do something else. Uh, I think uh, what we are going to do now is, uh, do you have any closing speech for them? This is the last time that you'll be seeing them. And then after that, uh, they would like to have an opportunity to have like a one week. Okay, sure. To wrap it up. Well, as you know, with any kind of demonstration um, or any kind of design, quite frankly, it, it takes time to do really good design. It takes time to do really good modeling. And that's the one thing that you have to remind yourself with using ZBrush or any, any program, even if you're using traditional clay, it's about giving yourself enough time to actually have success. As students, I think you're anxious as I would be. Actually, as I am a professional, I'm anxious to always see the end result. I want to get there as quick as possible because I'm excited. But just remember to slow down because if you move too quickly, you're likely to have the illusion that you're not actually doing well. If you go slow and you're patient, you'll have successes, smaller successes that stack up to greater control over time. Let me explain this ah, first sorry. part. Yes, I forgot. It's too long for my brain at this point. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is that the whole program is like the whole thing. It's like the whole thing. The whole thing is like the whole thing. We have to be careful. Like the whole thing is like the whole thing. When we come to the model, we want to see the whole thing. The whole thing is like the whole thing. The whole thing is like the whole thing. The whole thing is like the whole thing. เพย์เทนชันหรือว่าให้ความสำคัญกับเรื่องของพอพอชันเรื่องของอะไรก่อนนะครับ I know that most of you saw this morning's uh, workshop a presentation but what what I want to say and leave you with is is similar and that is that the ZBrush is a tool to communicate ideas the gentleman who asked the question about how would you sculpt anatomy brought up a very important point, and that is, that's the most important thing to know, is anatomy. Knowing ZBrush is not going to help you sculpt anatomy. Okay. Okay. So in closing, similar to having the patience with giving yourself the time to do something correctly, always know that the way to be in control of your design is to study the basics, the foundations, study human anatomy, animal anatomy, 
study how to draw in perspective with a pencil, how to render simple shapes. By going slow in the learning process and mastering the simple things, tools like ZBrush will allow you the vehicle to communicate your ideas. So patience, once again, is the most important attribute of software and education. So that is all I have to say and I have, I'm very appreciative for you paying attention and also I'm very impressed with what you were able to do in a short period of time by watching and following along so I hope that today was beneficial to you and thank you very very much. โอเคเดี๋ยวก่อนที่จะนี้นะครับก็คือเค้าบอกว่าอย่างเมื่อกี้ลืมท้ายสุดก็คือสุดท้ายคือเรื่องความอดทนกับงานแล้วเราก็ม
เฮ้ยเออไอ้เรื่องที่ว่าบังคับนั้นสามารถนี่ผมไม่รู้นะว่าบังคับหรือเปล่าแค่ไปบอกว่าเด็กเด็กอย่างนี่หรอหมายถึงเนี่ยเนี่ยรอบนี้เนี่ยเนี่ยอันนี้เขาบอกว่าในเวิร์กช็อปไอ้รอบเช้าไม่เกี่ยวไหนที่ไม่ว่าอันนี้มันเป็นของเนี่ยเวิร์กช็อปร้อนเต็มปิดเลยพี่น็อตปิดแล้วเหรอโลโลเต็มไมเลยพี่ก็ยังไม่ปิดยังออนอยู่